Good morning. Ooh. I'm going to shake you already um, with a question to you guys this morning. Uh, who likes pancakes? Raise your hand. Okay, so some of you know how many, I'd say, wha what you need to buy to make pancakes for six people, right? If you had to think about how to do it. I'm not going to ask you now what it's like, but I know there's eggs somewhere, right? Just imagine you're going to make these pancakes for six people. You're in your kitchen, and you have, I don't know, 10 eggs for that. And you open the cardboard with all the eggs, and all the eggs fall on the ground. No eggs. How do you make pancakes? I mean, they're on the ground. What do you decide to do? Do you take the, the eggs that are on the floor, and you still make your pancakes? Do you go buying one? But sometimes it's, I don't know, it's 7 in the morning, or shops open. So you didn't really manage the risk, like in a project or like an expedition. Okay, pancakes is not really making an expedition, but sometimes you're like, okay, when we're talking about minimal today, you take the minimal amount to do this, uh, pancakes for six people, and then you have a problem. And this is what I do in my expedition. So I try to find the minimal amount of things I need and try to do with it. And sometimes I fail in some parts, I have to be creative and find solutions. So I'm going to start with this photo. Um, this is uh, me, uh, the first minute when I just uh, left a Ford drive car to, um, to start my first expedition across what I call the mountains of the outback of Australia. This is Australia, you recognize it, and the yellow line in the middle is where this first expedition happened. I'm going to talk also in Australia about um, uh, the computer says I need power plug-in or something. 7% battery, I hope it should be okay. Okay, um, I'm going to talk uh, also about two other expeditions. And first things first, how did it all happen? Well, exactly eight years ago I was in Australia, first time, and I started doing hikes all over the country. And one day in the old back in Alice Springs, I met uh, three French guys, and we decided to go uh, walking on a track called the Lara Pinta Trail, which is a trail of 232 kilometers. And we decided just to do um, one, one step, one part of it. And it was absolutely stunning and very hard, actually, for us, because we, we didn't know really how to approach the outback. And and the um, and the mountains uh, in Australia like this, and we took what we had, like big backpacks, some food and cans, and so on. And on that day, with here with Julien, we woke up in the morning and we started running because we wanted to see the the sunset. And on the way back, we make the one one of these photos, and this is why we, we were like, hey, we went running for two three kilometers back and and forth back to our tent. And this was, was, this was awesome. We were completely free, no backpack, no nothing. And this is where we found out that like, hey, if we are lighter, perhaps we can go uh, longer distances. And this is where in my head it started to, to emerge the idea of doing the entire Lara Pinta Trail, these 232 kilometers in one shot. And I wanted to do it completely unsupported. The definition of unsupported uh, if you look in the literature online of the expedition, you can find many different um, definitions. Every adventure has a little bit of slight dif uh, different um, definition for it. My definition is when I'm unsupported, there's only me on the planet. So that means I'm not going to ask information if I would meet people. I'm not going to ask them, them something. I'm not going to buy food. I'm not going to put food caches on the way to take it back. So I start with everything I need for the journey. Is it still working? Oh, there's a lot of... Uh, I have to restart the computer in 10 minutes. I'm going to postpone that. <laughs> so, um, 
So during that trek, we, we also made one of these photos, and this is where we, we were like, wow, the, um, the landscape is absolutely stunning here in Australia, and this is uh, why the, the idea came from. In Australia, I also went walking in a rainforest, and this is where you, well, you see mainly in the rainforest, uh, lots of pools and ponds where you can take water from that are quite safe. Walking, it's, in, it's early in the morning, sorry guys, but I'm gonna wake you up. So of course in the rainforest, you start to have problems like leeches. So I walked an entire day without knowing I had this and uh, back, back home, I put out my boots and then I found this little fellow over here that was sucking me for I don't know how many hours. I did also tr uh, walking uh, around Melbourne area and forests. Uh, first time walking really uh, more than two days uh, alone. Uh, also, of course, when you walk, it's easily dark, especially in the winter where it's cold. But you meet sometimes night fellows. Uh, here's, a, here's a possum. I shared a few minutes of him. He was curious. I was curious. And this is, this is one of the advantages of being alone in the wild. We talk about minimal. Well, minimal can be alone when you, wor when you are walking is that because you're not talking to someone else, because you're only making sounds with your footsteps for only one person, you are very silent, if I could say that. And this is how you approach animals uh, with ease, and sometimes they approach you also. Sometimes big animals approach you too, but that is less funny. Um, Tasmania, um, this is one of the kind of landscapes you can find. Tasmania, um, mountains with uh, what they call abels, which is these cliffs to, to reach to the top. And this was uh, the one of the first big mountain I had to climb. I, I, had, I wanted to climb in Tasmania and um, with barely no map. And this is how I reached the summit. Oh, of course, the, the photo, I'm not really in the center. doesn't matter. I made the photo, I'm on the summit somewhere. Let's go back down because um, it starts to get serious because I, I, I start to see nothing. And actually, I went down the other way that I climbed up. And this is the, um, the way I started learning that, okay, when you start walking for more than two or three days, when you have your, f your, f your feet are wet, uh, you can have, of course, blisters on the sole of your foot, but you can also have this friction from your socks on the top of your, of your skin, and this is really painful. But again, the, the joy of seeing animals like a wombat or a wallaby. Does it work? Yeah, <laughs> because I see different things here. Uh, is really very um, the, the thing that motivates me to go. So lots of people ask me, why do you go? Why do you take that much pain? But the beauty I see and that I receive from nature uh, compensates the pain most of the time. And uh, so this is a, a beach uh, on Stewart Island in the south of uh, New Zealand. And then New Zealand, uh, the same year, I did the, this um, track called the Dusky Track with uh, six other people. We, we just hired um, a boat because you need to find, a, to, to find a boat to get you on the start of the track, which is an official marked track, but if the, it, it, it is the hardest of New Zealand. So um, on one side you have three uh, U.S. Marine Corps, and on the other side you have three Israeli paratroopers, and in the middle you have uh, a small Belgian and who was like, what am I doing here? I'm like in the middle of three guys' army, trained for many, many years, and I'm going kind of solo because they, worked, they, they were walking in group, and, uh, and I'm alone doing that. And preparing that track, we knew that we had to take a lot of food with us, because um, when there's a lot of rain in New Zealand, especially in some valleys that are connected together, the water can raise suddenly, and the track where you walk on can be completely in the water. So when I, I got to the Department of Conservation, say, hey, I want to do this walk, and um, at, you know, how many days do you plan? You know, I ask uh, several questions. And then he said, yeah, but if you know this water raised, the water is cold, uh, the river could, could swept you away. And then I said, what if I take a diving wetsuit with me for walking? And they're like, um, I don't know. Well, I didn't know I took one because I was also scuba diving. 
And actually, uh, I'm on the track there in the middle of the water, uh, walked like this for about two hours. It was cold, but not that cold with the, with the wetsuit. Uh, the Israeli guys, they actually climbed up high in the mountains where the cliffs were like 70 or 80 degrees. I still have no idea how they did, and they don't remember. I go back fast forward to this first expedition, the mountains of the Outback. After a few hours of walking, so my first expedition, the idea was to go and climb Mount Zail. Mount Zail is the highest summit you see on that photo. It is the highest mountain of Australia outside the, the east coast. So it's the highest mountain in the Outback. Um, the, and how, how is the, um, the terrain over there? Well, Australia is one of the uh, first part of the world that emerged, let's say, out of the seas when the planet formed and the, the mountains got pushed and the mountains are very, very ancient. So when you think of Australia, you know that it's, it, it can be very, very hot and in the desert, it can be very, very cold. Hot and cold means that the rocks split because of the difference of temperature. Uh, they are under stress all the time. And this makes that over the thousands and thousands of years, in the old back, you have a lot of rocks. And near the mountains, it's a carpet of rocks, like you can see here in, in other photos uh, later on. And then after two days, uh, I thought it would take me only one day and a half, I reached the summit of Mount Zale early in the morning. And I had to continue to the second mountain, which is um, Mount Razorback here, at the far distance seen from Mount Zale. I had no GPS, but I did not need any GPS by then because there's no forest. So basically, you climb on top of a rock or a mountain, you see the next one, and this is uh, where you have to go 20 or 30 kilometers further. When you go down Mount Zale, again, I said this, there are many, many rocks, big rocks. And in between, because I had a uh, limited uh, supply of water, it took me 11 days to do that, so I cannot carry really 11 days of water. If you take an average, let's say, of four liters per day, that's 44, 45 liters, plus your food, plus your bag, that would be um, perhaps 70 kilograms in a backpack, which is completely impossible. Try just to put it on your, on your back. Or, or if, if we, it would be like taking your mother and your, s your small sister on your back and starting walking. But you have to find water in many gorges. So this is a small pond where I found some water, but when you, you look closer on the moss that's growing on there, you find this nice butterfly, and I decided not to take water from that. This is actually cool because actually I have less water with me, or, or I had almost no more water with me, but I knew that if I was drinking from that, I would be sick. I also knew that not taking four or five extra liters with me, I'd be more lightweight to go further down Mount Sale in these rocks um, and to avoid injury because that is also a problem of being heavy. If you walk a long distance for many, many days, you become tired and it's easy to twist an ankle even if you have uh, really good boots. But again, is it worth it? This is the kind of landscapes uh, that I could see and this is my favorite photo taken from that trip. And it's actually a panoramic of two photos like the next one that I didn't crop, so you can, see, you can see that it was taken to photos. On the far uh, distance, you can see again Mount Zale, and I'm it's uh, probably four or five in the morning, and I'm starting to climb uh, Mount Razorback. But I was not the only person climbing it early in the morning. A large kangaroo was there. Very curious, because he probably ha never has seen a human before. Later on, I found, of course, another gorgeous water that felt um, safe. Why I felt that safe? Because that uh, piece of water was, was uh, in the shade, so there's less sun, so less life. If there's less life, there's less bacteria. But I got diarrhea anyway. But I was safe. Continue walking is, um, is the way you have to climb other, other summits. And then when I reached my last summit, I only had to follow the official track following the, the blue arrows you can see on the pole um, 200 kilometers or so further. Because when you walk from Mount Sale to Razorback and the, the last mountain, you are completely off track. There is no track. You have to find your own way. But I said it's not that hard because you can see everything. 
But sometimes you walk and you get a little bit tired in the sun. After a few days, I felt really the energy getting low. Also because of sickness, this diarrhea, you know, you, you lose your energy and sometimes you really have to rest. So, um, other not so friendly animals like big snakes. I believe that that's this is a pattern. Uh, if you un have to encounter one day snakes, just don't move or back off with big steps when you back off because then they hear the vibration in the, um, on the ground, on the soil, and they hear it that it's moving away. So they feel, okay, the, th the, the danger for them is actually uh, leaving. Snakes cannot see like 10 meters away from, from you, so it's fine. But if they go towards you, it pro probably means they have seen you and will attack. But there's not, not many snakes that will attack. Friendly animals, very curious. I was um, laying on the, on the rock, and this little fellow come, came just here to, to watch me eating. And I gave him a little bit of, a little bit of bread. At the end of the Larpinta Trail in Alice Springs, I found out that actually the track was done, uh, finished in 2002. I walked there with my friends this first lake in 2004, and this expedition was in September 2006. And um, the rangers over there told me that I was the first idiot to walk the entire Larpinta Trail completely unsupported, and on top I started off track uh, from Mount Sale and climbing Mount Sale, which made me the first a person to walk across the entire West McDonald's National Park uh, on my own. Of course, I had to take a lot of gear with me and food, so I used these uh, bladders from the, um, the wine goons, they call it in Australia, you know, these bags where you put the wine in. Um, I didn't drink the wine before I took it from other tourists. Um, I had uh, nuts, um, muesli bars, uh, powder milk, uh, of course, a tent, a sleeping bag, a mattress, and so on. And, uh, and several items that I, I didn't use, I thought I would use it, but I didn't. And this is where the process starts to think of what do I really need? Can I go with less stuff? And the first stuff that I started to not use on every other expedition uh, until now was the powder milk. In powder milk, there's absolutely no energy, very, very small. That I had there like a, a kilogram of powder milk, and I love, you know, milk. Now I just take oats with water. It's absolutely disgusting when you eat it home, but it's smoked salmon, happy days when on expedition. Water feels like champagne on every expedition. Maps, well, there were no maps, so I had to print out a screenshot that I um, kind of uh, joined together in paintbrush using the first version of Google Earth and Google Maps. I mean, it just went out, the, the software Google, Google Earth was just one, one year old, so no, not many details, but sometimes as good as a sketch. Then I went to my second expedition month after, crossing uh, Fraser Island from south to north. Fraser Island is the largest sandbar on the planet. O on the map here, you can see it's, um, it's green, but it's covered with... Um, with a lot of um, well trees and 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 forests, so it looks a bit like this. So perfect sand, and inside you have forest. And the idea was to cross it again, support it. So I took the the boat, and I started walking when uh, four drivers are using the um, the beach to drive. But you have many many lakes with fresh water um, on on the sandbar on Fraser Island, and this is what uh, makes it really really good because you don't have to carry much water, you can resupply every day or every two days. On, or, on other uh, landscape you can see, I mean it's kind of tropical, really paradise to, to go there. Other um, nice animals you can approach again, being silent, minimal. Uh, don't, don't try to do that, uh, getting close to, um, to a wreck, uh, especially when the waves coming from the ocean can um, put you down in the water, but uh, I was just wet, but with the sun you dry, you dry up very quickly. Uh, on Fraser Island, the airplanes also use the same uh, well stretch of sand as the cars to, to land and to take off. So be careful, sometimes when you hear um, a sound, say, okay, there's a car here, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna uh, pass me, no problem. And if the car, if I'm on the way of the car, you're gonna hear the the horn, but planes do not have horns, but it's not the same sound, so it's kind of okay. I, I notice it 
uh, before it took off. Uh, it landed just uh, next to me. On Fraser Island, um, you have, of, of course, lots of large patches of uh, sand dunes. This feels like perhaps the Sahara or something. It feels like it's fairly big, but don't worry. It's only two, three hundred meters long. It's not like five kilometers away. And what I love in uh, this um, sand is that I counted uh, seven different colors of sand. Here you have this kind of yellow, then some gray, some beige, some white, and some kind of dark sands made by the ashes of the trees that, uh, that burned down. But as I wanted also to cross the island inside, inland, I had to, um, to find my way. And with Google Maps, I had found in the top north part of the island, I had seen a white line, and I made some research, and, and I said, okay, there's a path there, that's, that's cool. If I found a path, um, actually it was really for cars, it was a forestry uh, path, I could just follow it, and the path was set 26 kilometers at 26, that's one day of walking, perfect, easy, and on the way there's a few lakes with water. Thing is, there was not always water in the lakes. When we talk about climate change, this is um, a lake that completely dried up, so I was a bit disappointed. You know, like you, you start your day, you have half a liter of water, and you know there's a lake perhaps 20 kilometers further, and you, d you are not sure how to reach it. Thing is that I found a road, you can perhaps see it, well, I'll go here very quickly, the, the line, and actually, the road had been closed uh, 30 years ago, so it's now almost 40 years ago. And it was completely overground of plants and trees and bush. So perhaps from the photos that were old, I could still see it, but it was very uh, hard. And actually, one day to do 26 kilometers, and away. There's still a bit of part here. It took me three days to do it. So I started to run low on food and low on water, and I was lost. Only way to not get lost, was to climb in the trees. Again, I had no GPS, so what I did is that I took in the trees, I was holding the tree like this with my legs, crossed legs, not to fall, even if I was a bit of moving, sometimes like this. Had my map on one hand, the compass, and I did some tri triangulation to more or less find where I was. A uh, third expedition was actually the most, um, the hardest, actually, I, I, I ever did. Uh, mentally and physically, was the crossing of the wilderness of Tasmania. This is the green part. It's, it has the size of Wallonia. So just imagine crossing Wallonia. It's about 160 kilometers. You could say, well, easy in a few days. Except that you have to imagine Wallonia 2,000 years ago when there's no roads and only trees and higher mountains. So I started with my backpack. And on my backpack, I clipped a dry bag full of food and I had about 40 kilograms on my pack. So, and on the side you can see I had here my tent, here my sleeping bag and just full of food, and here my camera and of course a GPS. You are in the forest in the mountains, you need a GPS. Now, this, is, this is how you walk in Tasmania. This is how you put your tent each night. Uh, you don't really know, of course, where you're gonna put it. I was following many tracks for two thirds of the distance, one third of the distance was off track to link these different uh, official tracks. And um, that was one of the very first days where, where I first, it was the first time in my life that I slept on the side of the mountain, 45 degrees. So the only way to kind of be leveled was to put my backpacks under my tent and to, to feel like a bit in, in a cradle and not to fall down with the tent, um, well, down in the bush. But I could attach of course, the tent uh, with, with the ropes. But again, it's worth it when you wake up in the morning, you see that you're like, wow, this is what I came to see. This is what I came from. Uh, this is why I came from. Crossing rivers in Tasmania can be very dangerous. Luckily, sometimes you find uh, a little bit of help. And this is me on the side, halfway through this uh, expedition. So still heavy, you have to still bend um, to, to get yourself balanced. Sometimes you walk and there's uh, what you call a mud pool, which means that it's like a trap. It looks completely hard ground and you step up, you, s you make one step and you, you, di you dig down in a mud pool up to here, you in water and mud. 
and you come out of course like this. Um, it's kind of funny, like you laugh, and that's, this is why you know when I was there, so okay, okay, I feel comfortable, I, I can take a photo. Thing is, when you get mud on your legs, where you, ha you are, you have been bleeding because you, um, you, you um, bumped onto branches and so on, you start to have an infection. And then two days later, okay, the, um, you have the scar and it will heal. Thing is that you bump again, the scar goes off, you get again mud and rain, and then you have a really, really big infection. So I got an infection on, on one leg and that was not really nice. Um, the good thing when you're minimal, when you have a small tent, my tent there was 1.5 kilograms, lighter exists, smaller exists too. I could sleep on top of a mountain, and this is really a privilege when you wake up in the morning, the sun is back there, you have a 360 view, and you can see where you have to go. You have to go, this is, was my aim to reach Federation Peak, the hardest mountain to climb in Tasmania. Uh, the project was called the Mountains of Tasmania, and I had to go there. Well, you can really see it, I'm gonna zoom on it a little bit. You can start to see the mountain, but I have to cross all these different mountains. So I climbed 19 mountains on the way, um, during that trip and of course when you only have three pair of socks um, and you change your sock every two weeks or so uh, well sometimes they, they, they get washed out with the water so they can <laughs> get clean but you start to have the um, parts of your sock mixing with your, your own skin and very hard it to um, to remove and actually my clean my feet are, are, are clean a bit further I could start to see Federation Peak and I was very scared. Well, I was told it was a bit scary. I'm not a climber at all. And I had to climb that thing. So the cliff is 600 meters high, but only starting from the, um, from the side, you only have 300 meters uh, to climb. But actually from the back, it's, it's not so hard. It's about like this. It's a kind of, I would say, like a ladder. There's only one part where you are completely vertical for three meters and you have to be very careful and otherwise it's very easy. But peop some people have been falling then. Yeah, you fall 600 meters. No chance of escaping. Um, in the mountains of Tasmania, after climbing Federation Peak, I had to reach the south coast, the water. And this is where there's no track at all. And I thought it would take me about a week. I talk, it took me a little more than two weeks to get across. I had 40 days of food with me, and this expedition lasted 49 days. This doesn't mean that for nine days I did not eat. It means that I had to ration uh, already my small food. So I had about 200 grams of food per day. That's like the, the meal you had uh, this morning. And with that, you, you have to walk 15 hours. I'd say walk, I'd say progress. My record of progressing in these vines and, and so on, um, in this well, jungle, uh, wet jungle, is 300 meters in six hours. And it's kind of not motivating yourself when you do that. And I finished uh, in the lagoon, walking in the sand, not on the rocks, because everything was so painful. I had my swollen legs, my swollen legs, sorry, only one at that time, that was really, really big. and. You remember the first photo, how I started in Tasmania with the big pack, and uh, after 49 days, I finished like this. Uh, well, my, my, my clothes were broken, my heart was broken, my brain was broken, my camera was dead, my GPS was dead. I had lost several things like my watch and things like that, that you, when you walk, my watch suddenly got off uh, in the bush and I could not find it anymore. I didn't re even realize I lost it. It's good you lose weight, it's easier to walk when you lose weight. But when you lose your watch, it's, it's not nice when you did uh, the, four s the four last days without time. Iceland. In Iceland, I had to, um, uh, the idea was to go from north to south, uh, unsupported. Uh, same principle. I'm going to show you a few photos. Trying to uh, get my socks dry. Um, hard terrain with the lava where I got um, also um, a bit of, uh, of a problem. I, uh, for the first time in my life, I saw my bone, and I, uh, I went minimal, so I took only one meter of bandage, so I went around one time, and then I had to finish uh, 12, 12 days with it, and this was not the, let's say, the um, safest idea. So when I say however, perhaps sometimes you, you, you have to get two, 300 grams of more stuff with you. 
Um, the ice of the glacier was covered with the ash. You all remember the Afia Yoko, the, the volcano that burst, it was the same year. I didn't choose to go uh, that year because of that, I hadn't planned it. And when it's completely covered with ash, this is actually white ice covered with two or three centimeters of ash. Beautiful landscapes in Iceland. And I come to the last one that was in uh, October last year. I wanted to become the first person to cross the two largest Salars on the planet in, U in Uyuni without a cart. Some people have uh, done o only Uyuni with a cart in uh, five days or so. And I had planned eight days. And I felt middle, I start north in the middle of, at the Isla in Kawasi. Uh, I finished uh, this track uh, because the pain made me walk only uh, two kilometers per hour, and I had 4.5 liters left to finish the, the, tr the, the walk. Uh, 90 kilometers, and I divided everything. So, okay, I have to walk, uh, I have nine, uh, sorry, 30 hours of water left. I have 90 kilometers to do, though, so that's, if I don't sleep, three hours, uh, three kilometers per hour. Should be easy, but I had massive blisters and the pain was making me walk only two kilometers per hour. And of course I can resist the, the pain like everyone to some extent, but when it's every and every footstep and you are basically just too slow, it doesn't work. This is uh, Uyuni, so I believe some of you have been there. And you know, it's full of salt. And what does the salt do on you is that it's um, rubbing here very strong. I had, I removed the bandages, but I had like 10 or 12 bandages over there. And um, I started the expedition with a pack of 56 kilograms. And uh, so because I failed, I'll, I will try again in the next years. I don't know when exactly. And I will try to be around 45 uh, kilograms when starting and try to do it in six days and a half. This is what I learned. But in all these uh, expeditions that are considered just walking, tracks. Lots of people, lots of adventurers would say, oh, polar expeditions, rowing across the oceans, climb the Everest is hard. And I, I found someone who, um, who did actually all these kind of expeditions. And she, it was a woman, she told me, walking across desert snow, the pain is every day. You know, climbing Everest, the hard day is really the summit day. Walking, it's hard every day because you have to progress and you are limited with all your supplies. And I had one item on all these expeditions that would make my uh, life completely miserable. You need water, you need the basics, water, food uh, to survive. But there's one thing mentally that you absolutely need. Without that, you'll be miserable. In the deserts, you'll, you'll have a lot of problems. If you don't have toilet paper with you, just imagine in the desert. Okay, let's say you don't have it, you have to use, what do you use, your hand, sand, but then you have to clean it with water. But no, your water is for drinking. How do, how do you do? I, if you do that in the, in, in the forest, okay, you can use a branch, but perhaps there's uh, something that will go into your arse. Or um, perhaps you, you use a leaf of a poisonous plant because you don't know it. So trust me, toilet paper will help you. Because also if you go fast with toilet paper, remember in the desert you have many, many flies going on you and this is annoying, very annoying. The hardest part in the desert is fighting against the mentally breaking uh, flies that are around you flying all day. It's very, very hard. 